Wait till after? Sure. Okay, cool, cool. I was thinking, in keeping with the uh, auto sharing, share. And we're live at 7.01. In keeping with the relatively informal nature of our broadcast, um, probably a totally appropriate for our viewing audience to hear um, gearheads chatting about stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's also fine if it waits. Either is good. <laughs> Hello once again and welcome to uh, Motor Gospel Ministries TV. We're glad you're joining us tonight. Um, we've had an incredible week. You probably get tired of hearing me say that, but uh, it's true. There's just there's so much going on all the time. Really exciting stuff. Um, Jerry and I have been a little bit involved with, uh, uh, I was going to say Talbot because Talbot was a seminary I attended, but the Biola, that's the undergraduate college, the Biola startup competition. They're having something sort of like Shark Tank at Biola University. Biola is a very strong Bible-based Christian university, and they're having like a Shark Tank there. Uh, sort of exploring the shades of gray of capitalism without the inappropriate excesses, the materialism, the greed, um, the corruption, things like that, that are obviously displeasing to our Lord. And we're real excited to be a part of that. I don't know that we're actually going to compete in it, but we're having a lot of fun. Uh, it's really invigorating uh, interacting with the young people at the campus and, and just seeing the continuous learning going on and the fresh young faces and people with so many cool dreams. Um, uh, I encourage you, if you're on Facebook, check out the uh, Biola startup competition from Biola University if, uh, if you can find it on there. It may be a closed group. I'm not sure. And then uh, we'll have quiet music. As you know, we rock out six days a week with loud music, fast cars, and, and uh, making a big impact in the community. But on the Sabbath, we rest. This is a time to be quiet and reverent before the Lord. We'll play real quiet music um, uh, till approximately 8 o'clock. And um, you're welcome to watch, but I'm nothing much to look at. This isn't really about an entertaining broadcast with stuff to see. I encourage you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And um, if you want to even literally kneel or literally fall on your face, um, that's worship as far as the Bible is concerned. Worship, according to the Bible, has nothing to do with music. It's all about bowing. Um, uh, so that would be good uh, if you fall asleep, as long as it's not falling asleep out of boredom. It's not irreverent if you're falling asleep because you're in your daddy's loving embrace. And what we're doing with the tunes is so peaceful to you that you fall asleep safe in your daddy's loving embrace. Um, we have some people uh, uh, suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder where the only good sleep they get is... Um, uh, sitting in the presence of the Lord and, and uh, feeling the, 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 the Father's loving embrace around them. And then uh, we'll be having an interesting message tonight, uh, drawing some startling, surprising parallels between affirmative action programs in the world and soteriology in the kingdom. And then uh, we'll be breaking bread together around 8.30. If you're on your way, we're at 13691 Gavina Avenue, Unit 524, Silmar, California, 91342. Um, and if you're checking us out from home, you're glad you, we're glad you joined us. Uh, you are loved. And uh, may you experience God's rest this Sabbath evening. And by the way, I don't know. You're hearing a lot about the, the, the blood moon, the fourth blood moon coming this Sunday. Will that be the start of the tribulation? Will it be a nuclear holocaust? Will the Lord return? Uh, I'm here to tell you, I don't know. I spent eight years in the seminary. I've been walking with Jesus over 20-something years, and uh, I don't know. Um, I know the Bible says the Lord won't come back until the man of lawlessness has been revealed. Has the man of lawlessness been revealed? Did we see him in Congress? Did we see him in the White House? I don't know. Uh, ask God. Um, certainly there are some signs that make it look like that, that last blood moon coming this Sunday is uh, uh, signaling something really big, but I don't know. And um, uh, I would just uh, suggest to anybody that's panicking about it, that's, that's uh, filled with fear and anxiety, the most important thing is, are you born again of the Holy Spirit? If you're born again of the Holy Spirit, you're ready to go with Him. And if you're not born again of the Holy Spirit, you're not ready to go with Him. That's the important thing. It's not so much, are we going to have the tribulation starting this Sunday night or Monday morning? Or is the Lord going to come back? Or will there be a nuclear holocaust? This, that, or the other. It's more about, are you ready to go with Him? Because none of us might make it home tonight. You never know. You might get hit by a bus tonight or something. And how do you get born again? I wasn't going to preach right now, but how do you get born again? It's nothing you or I do. We play a role in it that we don't fully understand, but the majority of the work is done by God. It's a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. So if you're not sure, I just encourage you to pray to God. Even if you're not sure if he exists, pray to him, even being sincere about that, saying, I don't know for sure if you exist, Lord. 
Just pray to him, ask him, if you exist, and if I'm not born again, cause me to be born again by a miraculous work of your Holy Spirit, no matter what the cost, cause me to be born again so that you don't have to have anxiety about whether the fourth blood moon is going to indicate the end of the world Sunday night or not. Thank you for joining us. We're going to get started. Boruch Atarnai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvosov It's Ivanu Lahad Likner Shal Shabos
set me apart. I know you're drawing me to yourself. Lead me, Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray. I'm captured by your holy calling. Set me apart. I know. Lead me, Lord, I pray, Lord, I pray, make me, mold me, use me, fill me, I give my life, heart to Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for molding us. Thank you for filling us. Thank you for using us. Thank you for leading us. Thank you for guiding us.
Yes. to you, Lord.
Thine is the glory, Thine is the power forever. Amen. Thine is the kingdom, Thine is the glory, Thine is the power forever. Amen. Thine is the kingdom, Thine is the glory, Thine is the power forever. Amen. Thine is the kingdom, Thine is the glory, Thine is the power forever. Amen. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the glory. Thine is the power forever. Amen. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the glory. Thine is the power forever. Amen. Thine is the kingdom. Thine is the glory. Thine is the power forever. Amen.
Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. us, Lord. Heal our hearts and make them clean. Open up our eyes to the things unseen. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. for what breaks yours everything I am for your kingdom cause as we walk from life into eternity Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. 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 of 
of the Lord lay down your head enter in the rest of the Lord the battle awaits the before your throne, Lord. We bow to you alone. And we say as the clay says to the potter, have your way with us. Shape us however you want to, Lord. If there are areas where our hearts are not bowed down, Break our hearts, Lord. If that's what it takes. I pray, Lord Jesus, that everybody hearing my voice would be born again, no matter what the cost. A miraculous work of your Holy Spirit. That no matter what they or I might have to give up in this life, that we would all be together with you in heaven for all of eternity.
Have mercy, Lord. Tonight I lift up especially the, the people that haven't had the miracle that, that I've had and that Teddy's had and Jerry's had. I lift up the sincere people that they just know it, it hasn't happened for them yet. And they don't want to go through the motions. They don't want to be hypocritical. They don't want to pretend to be Christians when it's not in their heart. I pray for those people tonight, Lord. I pray that you'd have mercy on those people. I pray that you'd see the sincerity of their hearts. I pray that you would do for them tonight what you did for me, what you did for Tare, what you did for Jerry, so many others. That they would know something happened. Have mercy on those sincere ones tonight. Those that don't know you in a miraculous way. They haven't had the miracle. And they're honest about who they are. I pray, please, Lord, honor their honesty. Give them the miracle. That their lives would never be the same. as we come up on this last uh, blood moon for now I pray for pray for your kids everywhere I pray for your kids that are being slaughtered by by Muslims I pray for your kids that are being hated by so called enlightened people people that have been well indoctrinated bought a bunch of lies articulately packaged lies pray that you'd have mercy on your kids that you put wisdom on their tongues and courage in their hearts we don't know if this blood moon is indicating something really cataclysmic coming up you're not a god of superstition but you do give us signs sometime We're seeing what seemed like a lot of signs. So I pray for your kids everywhere in the world, Lord, that especially Sunday night with, a, with the last blood moon, I pray that you protect your kids. Have mercy on this great nation of the United States of America. Lord, I know we have many more faithful here than there were in Sodom and Gomorrah. I pray for the sake of the faithful here in America, the millions and millions of faithful. I pray that you'd have mercy on the United States of America. Purify my heart Let me be as gold And precious silver Purify my heart Let me be as gold Pure gold 
finder's fire My heart's one desire Is to be Set apart for you, Lord, I choose to be holy. Set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Purify my heart, cleanse me from my sin, and make me holy. Purify my heart, cleanse me from within, and deep within. Refiner's fire My heart's one desire Is to be holy Set apart for you, Lord I choose to be Lord, I pray for everybody hearing my voice here in the chapel and at home in the viewing audience around the world, whether they're in Kenya or Tennessee or Glendale, Jerusalem, wherever they might be. I pray for everybody hearing my voice that they would be set apart, that they would be holy in your sight, Lord, for your purposes. And if being set apart on your terms means we look really, really freakish to the world, so be it. And if being set apart on your terms means we look really ordinary to the world, so be it. We know that holiness, your holiness, is more than skin deep. We know that holiness, your holiness, is more than what brand of jeans you wear, or if you wear jeans at all, or if you wear a loincloth, or if you wear a kilt, or if you wear a kimono. We know that holiness, your holiness, uh, is a lot more deep than what kind of makeup you wear or if you wear any makeup at all. I pray for everybody hearing my voice tonight that we would all be set apart corporately and individually. Not everybody's set apart to drive the John 3.16 car. Some are set apart to drive the Ephesians 6.12 car. Some are set apart to not even drive. And, and that's okay. You have one body, you have many parts. May each of us be set apart in our own special individual way on your terms. And may each of us be set apart, may we be set apart corporately as your body coming together in your name and by your miraculous power, by your Holy Spirit. And I pray that whatever happens Sunday night with this blood moon, that the world would see uh, uh, an immense uprising of the faithful, your faithful, Lord, the real thing, the ones for whom being born again is more than just skin deep. Thank you, Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I'll sit quietly. If anybody else wants to pray out loud, feel free to or pray silently.
Lord, I lift up all the prayer requests that came from Brother Carlos Cantero. Um, I don't have time to list them all, but you know all the prayer requests. And I come in agreement with Brother Carlos on all of these prayer requests that he listed. And I pray that as we get into your word tonight, that you would cause me to be very humble about my opinions. Not wrong to have an opinion, but that my opinions would be held very humbly compared to the word of God. And I pray that I wouldn't say anything wrong. And if I do, I pray that you'd even have somebody right here in the chapel to correct me or that somebody would uh, send us a message on Facebook or on the, the chat feature on Ustream. And I pray that if I say anything wrong, that you'd protect the hearers from any mistakes that I would make. But I pray that I would not say anything wrong. Pray that you would shine fresh light on your word tonight for us, Lord. That even if it's the same word we've read again and again and again for many, many years, that you would show us something new something fresh, a fresh application. Pray that it would be a light under our path, lamp under our feet, that it would protect us from deceit and confusion, especially in these coming days. I pray this in your precious and holy name, Jesus. Amen. Yeah. What was the deal here? Stand by. Okay. Let me check and see if there's anybody on Facebook. Microphone still on. Okay, good. Stand by. Oh, if you could get those uh, the theology uh, category sheets off the printer, if anybody wants to take notes off the the sheets tonight's category is soteriology. Soteriology is a fancy word for how you get saved. For those that don't know, we have uh, approximately ten categories, and you know I'll, I'll take one too, in, as a matter of fact, so I can follow along. Thank you kindly. Did we find pens that were functional, at least three or so? Yeah. Okay, I'll take one if you don't mind. Okay. Pen or pencil, whatever, crayon. <laughs> ah, thank you, thank you. Hey, I know it's out of ink. <laughs> uh, Ooh, if it's no trouble. Is it no trouble? Thank you, if you would. Okay. So, um, I have an unusual message tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about the startling and unexpected similarities between affirmative action programs and Christian soteriology, according to the Bible. Um, uh, the uh, uh, brief reminder for those that, that don't have the sheet at home, there are, I don't know if you can see this. I guess you sort of can. Uh, Motor Gospel Chapel, uh, we give people uh, a sheet with the 10 uh, theology, approximately 10 theology categories um, that are acknowledged. These are just useful tools. They're not laws of the universe. The Bible doesn't explicitly talk about these categories, but they've stood the test of time. They're very useful tools for Christian theologians uh, to understand the Bible. And those categories are theology proper. Theology proper is the study of God. That's distinct from all of systematic theology, biblical systematic theology, includes the study of more than just God. For example, um, how do we know whether men are reincarnated? That's not, thank you kindly. Um, uh, we know whether people are reincarnated or not uh, based on studying the Bible, but that is not theology proper. That's the study of man, anthropology. Does man get reincarnated? No, not according to the Bible. So, Theology proper is the study of God. Bibliology is the study of the Bible. Anthropology is the study of man. Christology is the study of Christ. Is Christ a man? Is he a God? Is he half a man and half a God? Is he 100% man, 100% God? These are things that you would study in Christology. 
Um, and we do all of this using the Bible as the highest authority under the influence of the Holy Spirit. It's not wrong for us to have opinions, but if we would claim to be Christians, uh, we should hold our opinions very humbly compared to the authority uh, with which we hold Scripture. Soteriology, the study of how we get saved. Are you saved based on uh, what church you go to? Are you saved based on whether you wear a suit, a Brooks Brothers suit, instead of uh, flip-flops and shorts to church? Um, are you saved based on whether you drink a beer or not? So that's soteriology. Um, are you saved by works or are you saved by faith? That's a big one. That's soteriology. Pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. Homardiology, the study of sin. Angelology, the study of angels. And that would include, by extension, the study of demons. Demons are fallen angels. Um, they're all uh, angels, according to the Bible. Ecclesiology, the study of church, the church. And eschatology, the study of the end times. So tonight's topic, if you're following along, and the way we use the sheet is we just, as we look at the scriptures, um, sometimes some scriptures might give you information about several different topics, like something could tell you something about theology proper and about anthropology. So that scripture, you might put some notes in there under uh, the same verse uh, for both of those theological categories. And then at the bottom, we have some little applica application. I don't know if you can read the real fine print, but it says something like, uh, what does it mean for me? What, are, what do we write there? Oh, in my life, uh, the famous Beatles song, in my life. Um, yeah, it says in my life. And that's basically just application. Whatever it was we learned from this teaching about these particular theological categories, what does it mean to me? How do I apply it in my life? So... If anybody's interested that's in the viewing audience that's not here with us, we can get you the sheet. We can email you the sheet if you want to use it at home to follow along with us. So tonight, we're going to be talking about soteriology and the surprising um, uh, relationship between uh, affirmative action programs and soteriology. Um, uh, everything that I'm going to tell you tonight is imperfect. Well, the Bible is perfect. Um, uh, the sermon illustrations I'm going to be talking about, the relationship between soteriology and affirmative action programs, that relationship is imperfect. It doesn't make it invalid. It just makes it imperfect. I'm going to be employing analogies or sermon illustrations imperfectly. And I'm in very good company uh, in doing so because Jesus employed, you would think everything Jesus did was perfect, right? He's the Lord. But he did something imperfectly. I don't believe this is irreverent because... When he did it imperfectly, it was still perfect. If he did it, it was perfect and righteous. That includes, and this is hard to wrap our, at least it's hard to wrap my mind around this, that includes if the Lord did something imperfectly, then apparently perfection in God's sight, perfection on God's terms, didn't require perfection in every term that man might understand the concept of perfection. So I'm in good company talking about this subject tonight, presenting you with imperfect analogies, I'm in good company with Jesus. You know how I know that? Any guess? Okay, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl. Do you think he meant it's this big? I think not. Do you think he meant the kingdom of heaven is spherical and white and, and highly reflective? Doubt it. Do you think he meant it's made out of Oyster snot or oyster spit or whatever. What are pearls made out of? They're like oyster spit or something, right? <laughs> A grain of sand, they start spitting on it yeah. and it gets real hard and shiny. Jesus made an imperfect analogy. If you said, hey, for this to be the perfect analogy, um, it would only be true if the kingdom of heaven is made out of oyster spit and is hard and shiny and highly reflective and white and is this big. Um, otherwise, that's not a perfect analogy. Um, so I'm in good company with Jesus in using, he used parables. We tended to call them parables, not analogies, but it's the same kind of thing. It's a sermon illustration. It helps you to understand things in an analogous fashion. But on the other hand, with his being the Lord, you could say, well, it was still a perfect analogy because coming from him and there was no guile found in Jesus' mouth, everything he said was true. We have to presume that he meant the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl in the following regard or in this way. And then he went on with the parable. He wasn't meaning to imply that the kingdom of heaven is this big. He wasn't meaning to imply the kingdom of heaven is spherical and white and highly reflective. He wasn't meaning to imply the kingdom of heaven is made out of oyster spit or oyster snot or whatever it is. So either way you look at it, um, I'm in good company using these imperfect analogies tonight with Jesus who used apparently imperfect or limited analogies. Maybe limited would be a better word than imperfect. Um, in this country, so these are fictitious uh, sermon illustrations I've given you. Any, any resemblance to uh, any persons living or dead <laughs> is, is, is mostly coincidental, yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I can't say I'm, I'm perfectly able to shut out the world and not imitate anything I've seen in coming up with sermon illustrations, but hypothetically, these are, these are not historically accurate. So you don't have to slam me on historical accuracy. I'm just making some analogies. In World War II, loyal Japanese Americans were put in quasi-prison camps. They called them internment camps here in America. It was not because the Americans wanted to treat the Japanese unfairly, by and large, in stark contrast to Hitler's trying to wipe out the Jews. Um, uh, the Americans were not trying to wipe out the Japanese in America. They just weren't sure we were at war with Japan, and they weren't sure where the allegiances would lie for the Japanese Americans who were pretty much loyal Americans, but they weren't really sure. Could they be used to do some terrorism or send some messages or something? So unfortunately, America treated Japanese Americans very, very badly in World War II through no fault of, uh, by and large, through no fault of these loyal Japanese Americans. And yet you, totally, you can't totally blame America for wanting to be careful. It wasn't like they were trying to oppress them or something like that. They just weren't really sure who to trust. So you might imagine an affirmative action program. This is totally made up uh, just for the purposes of making this illustration. Affirmative action program that says, you know, all these years later, we were really mean to you, Japanese, and it wasn't your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. We weren't trying to oppress you. Uh, we just didn't really know who we could trust. We were at war with your fatherland, your mother, your country. You know, your brothers were over there um, in dive bombers or whatever. So we weren't really sure who we could trust. We're sorry that we had to put you in these internment camps. We're sorry that we were really mean to you. We didn't really have any other way to know how to handle it. And so as a result, we're going to make an affirmative action program. If you are Japanese and there's only one position for $100,000 a year engineering starting salary job, um, and there are 100 applicants, if you're Japanese, you come to the front of the line. We're, <laughs> we're going to let you in. Uh, even if you're up against other more qualified candidates that are not Japanese, you're going to get the job instead of them. And we can't totally make it up for you, everything we did to your families, putting you in camps and taking your homes and all this stuff. But at least we can give you $100,000 a year starting salary, even if you're not the most qualified candidate, simply because you're Japanese. Affirmative action program, trying to make reparations for having put loyal Japanese Americans in internment camps in the 1940s. Make sense? So this dude... He was not a very good engineering student. His grades were pretty mediocre. He didn't get a summer job like some of the others did, setting them up for graduation, setting them up for having a bit of a resume. And, um, uh, but he had a plan. He heard about this affirmative action program to make reparations to the Japanese that were thrust into the internment camps. And um, he went and got plastic surgery. So his eyes became <laughs> almond shaped. <laughs> and he changed his name to uh, Yamazaki. And, um, and, and he sent a resume to these people and, um, and uh, they, they ushered him in. They brought him to the front of the line and they were so glad to meet Mr. Yamazaki uh, with his almond-shaped eyes <laughs> and look at his resume. And yeah, it was a pretty crappy resume, admittedly, and he had no work experience and he hadn't shown enough initiative to get a summer job like some of his classmates against whom he was competing. But after all, he was Japanese and they wanted to make reparations. So <laughs> they, they shook his hand. They were interviewing him and welcoming him aboard and stuff like that. And uh, the interview went pretty well. And they said, uh, okay, just... Uh, Lick this uh, cotton swab, and, uh, and uh, we'll get back to you. Um, <laughs> that was the last test, so he gave them the cotton swab and uh, jammed out of there, and they, uh, they checked his DNA and found out his DNA was, he was a white boy. He wasn't Japanese, and even though he had really lovely almond-shaped eyes <laughs> and he had changed his name to Yamazaki, his Japanese-ness, if I could coin that adjective, his Japanese-ness was only skin deep. He had made a little makeover to make him sort of Japanese, changed his name and changed his appearance. It didn't make him Japanese on the inside. It didn't change his DNA. And they brought him in and they said, uh, dude, <laughs> Yamaz Mr. Yamazaki, Yamazaki-san, <laughs> uh, we checked your DNA. You're not Japanese. <laughs> Get this guy out of here. Throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what happened to the so-called Yamazaki-san because his Japanese-ness was only skin deep. His DNA was not Japanese, unlike his appearance after the plastic surgery. Well, sometime later, somebody noticed that there was not an abundance, and Ben will relate to this, knowing a lot more about sports than I do. There was not an abundance. Can you name a lot of power forwards that are under five foot five inches tall? <laughs> In the NBA, somebody noticed that the NBA was discriminating. Against, <laughs> against short people <laughs> in their hiring of power forwards to be starters in the NBA. <laughs> Somebody took careful note, 
compiled careful statistics <laughs> to prove their point. And you know, they couldn't find one power forward in the NBA that was under five foot five inches tall. <laughs> so, so they threatened the NBA with a lawsuit for their obvious discrimination. <laughs> and the NBA, please don't sue us. <laughs> in response to that, they didn't want to lose all the millions they'd lose for this obvious discrimination. They were busted dead to rights, right? <laughs> so they created an affirmative action program where anybody who signed up to be a power forward that was shorter than five foot five inches tall would go to the front of the line whether they were, <laughs> whether they were otherwise qualified or not. <laughs> and this dude named Costanza that was six foot five inches tall, <laughs> he went out and he got his shin surgically amputated. <laughs> he got his legs amputated below the knee and had his feet sewn onto his, where his knees were. So, <laughs> so he was now five foot four inches tall. He had been six foot five and was not good enough to be power forward in the NBA. He was a pretty crappy b-ball player but now he was less than five foot five inches tall <laughs> so they oh they they welcomed him with open arms they saw him coming a mile away look at the short guy hey short guy <laughs> this will look great in the evening news we'll put our arms around him and stuff they welcomed him the interview went bitching he jumped in ahead of other people that were way way more qualified to be power forwards than he was but after all he was less than five foot five he was exactly what they were looking for and they said cool beans dude um you'll start tuesday presuming you just have to pass this other one more test. Um, lick this cotton swab for us, would you? <laughs> so he licked the swab and gave him the swab, and he, he jammed out of there. And they checked his DNA and found out he had the DNA of a man who was six foot five inches tall, not a man who was five foot four, despite the lovely grafting of the feet onto his kneecaps. <laughs> and they called him in, and they said, Costanza, we checked your DNA. You were born to be six foot five, not five foot four. Get this guy out of here. Throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He was out of there. Short time later, somebody noticed in the workplace, they, they compare, compiled careful statistics and found that women made on average $10,000 a year less than men even for doing the exact same job uh, in the, the subset of jobs, and there are plenty of them, where women and men are approximately equally qualified, jobs that don't favor one gender or the other. Um, the women were, uh, on average, making $10,000 a year less than the men. So somebody, again, was threatening lawsuit, discrimination, gender-based discrimination, and stuff like that. And, uh, and companies all over were like bending over backwards, going, oh, please don't sue us, please don't sue us, we'll do anything, we'll do anything. So they created a, an affirmative action program for women, saying, if you are a woman, we will automatically pay you $10,000 more than, than any man that comes and flies, <laughs> because we don't want to get sued for, we want to we want to make up for the sins of the past, after all, we discriminated against you, we were so unfair, you know, la, 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 la. So this dude, Bruce, uh, caught wind of this, and uh, um, he was not real qualified for the job. He was okay, but he saw an easy $10,000 a year raise, right? So he went and got himself mutilated, got his genitalia surgically removed. He got his apple, Adam's apple, you know, uh, reshaped a little bit, so it looked really dainty and, 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 and smooth and, and feminine, and, um, you know, got his eyebrows done and stuff, and he changed his name to Caitlin. <laughs> and so Caitlin went and said, hey, where's my 10,000 bucks? You know, my signing bonus or whatever. I'm, I'm a woman. I want this $10,000, you know, blah, blah. and they're saying, oh, good. Welcome aboard, Caitlin. And fine, you know, just uh, one more test and, and you'll get started. I'll lick this cotton swab for us. And uh, Caitlin licked the swab and gave it to them and walked out. And um, they went and did the tests and they, they called Caitlin in and they said, Caitlin, <laughs> you're a dude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they said, we, we checked your DNA and we found out you produce sperm, not eggs. You have an Adam's apple. <laughs> and uh, you're, you're rich in testosterone, but you're, you're uh, very lean in, in estrogen. Caitlin, um, <laughs> you're a dude, you know. <laughs> Get this guy out of here. <laughs> Throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So... All three of these affirmative action programs and people's attempts at capitalizing on these affirmative action programs have something in common. And that is all three of them are like makeovers um, uh, from the outside only. You know, getting almond-shaped eyes, cutting off the legs, um, you know, mutilating the genitalia and the Adam's apple and doing eyebrows and stuff like that. It's only skin deep. 
It's not at the DNA level. Um, the guy's Japanese-ness was only skin deep. The dude's shortness was only skin deep. It wasn't at the DNA level. And certainly Caitlin's femininity was only skin deep. She was a dude. She made sperm, not eggs, um, as evidenced by the, the DNA test. So what does this have to do with soteriology? Um, if we look at Matthew 7, and we're certainly not going to, if you brought your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 7. We're certainly not going to study everything. I'm looking at the time. Okay, we're not going to study everything that one could possibly study about soteriology tonight. We're going we're gonna to barely touch the subject. You could spend weeks and weeks and weeks on fine shades of gray on soteriology. But at a course level, what I want you to understand is um, Yamazaki wasn't Japanese, Costanza wasn't short, and Caitlin was a dude, right? So <laughs> um, looking at Matthew 7, um, uh, 7 and, um, uh, sorry. Matt 7 and verse 21. Matt seven twenty one. Jesus is talking, and Jesus in Matthew seven twenty one says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. So first of all, I'm going to trick you a little bit, but I think this is a valuable discipline for you to get into. Um, we're going to write down, well, I'm going to write down, you can write whatever you want, on uh, Matthew 7.21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So if we look just at what Matthew 7.21 contributes to our understanding of soteriology, our systematic understanding of soteriology, we would say, okay, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter. So evidently saying, Lord, Lord, is not good enough for you to be saved. And not right. More fun. Very good point. Because some people are saying everybody goes to heaven. There's no need to evangelize or whatever, right? That's a very good point. Not everyone gets to enter. Dude, you, if I had a gold star right now, I'd stick it on your forehead. I didn't even catch that. That's, that's so important. So one, huh? So one, not everyone enters. Not everyone enters. I'm putting down. Thank you, Jerry. Not everyone. And then two, Lord, Lord is not adequate to get you to enter. But here's the part where it's a little bit tricky. We want to deal honestly with the text. And now we're getting into bibliology a little bit. I wasn't going to talk about bibliology, but we'll get into it a little bit. We want to deal honestly with the text. And if we're dealing honestly with the text, Jesus is saying, he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. So uh, will of my Father will enter. So that, if that was the only scripture in the Bible of, uh, uh, regarding soteriology, uh, well, my father will enter, you would say, okay, then I guess you go to heaven based on doing good works. I guess you go to heaven, uh, uh, you know, you only go to heaven if you're good enough because um, you're doing the will of the father. And this is where we're getting into bibliology a little bit, which I wasn't planning on. But to truly understand what Jesus means by that, which I don't fully understand it, but to, to understand it as best you can, you have to read it in light of the rest of the scripture. You can't take it out of context. This verse alone, he who does the will of my father will enter. That makes it sounds like you're going to earn your salvation based on doing God's will. And, but other parts of the Bible strongly suggest that you don't get saved based on the work that you do. You don't earn salvation based on how good you are doing the will of the Father. So that's where we get into bibliology a little bit. And that says context, context, context. You might have one scripture that seems to say one thing, but when you read it in the context of the rest of scripture, it doesn't really say it. Perhaps indeed. Right? Right? And maybe it's even something mysterious, like what does it mean to do the will of his Father? Maybe somehow in, in Jesus' way of speaking, that could be beyond our understanding sometime, maybe doing the will of the Father is not work, as we understand work. Maybe by doing the will of the Father, um, it means something much more mysterious and obscure like uh, a miraculous thing that only God can do um, I don't know 
But so, but just reading this much, it sounds like not everyone who says Lord, Lord will enter, but he who does the will of, of uh, Jesus' Father who is in heaven will enter. Um, many will say, uh, verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So more soteriology, it seems like they were thinking that uh, either prophesying and casting out demons and doing miracles in Jesus' name would either, either that earn salvation for them or they were saying, is that not evidence that we're saved? We don't really know what they meant by asking that question. But he nonetheless, he didn't deny that they did any of those things. He didn't say, oh, no, you didn't cast out demons. He didn't deny that they did any of those things. He simply said, I never knew you. Right, right. Maybe. Like, like um, <coughs> Jesus said, the Pharisees uh, praised him with his lips, but their hearts were falling. Yes, 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 big time. May none of us ever hear that depart from me I never knew you that's the scariest thing in the world Lord no matter what the cost may we never hear that so prophesying and prophesying and casting out demons prophesying casting out demons out demons and doing miracles all in Jesus name he didn't dispute that they did that but uh, but he said, I never knew you. Miracles, not adequate for salvation. There's also an implication that uh, not saved if Jesus says he never knew you. Uh, apparently, not saved if Jesus says I never knew you. Never knew you. So interesting, these people, they did good stuff. They cast out demons, they did miracles, they prophesied in Jesus' name, and he doesn't deny that they did that stuff. And he's not even saying, oh, you did that stuff in your own name, or you created counterfeit miracles or something. So that's really confusing. I mean, we look at a Judas. There's, there's evidence of Judas moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, doing miraculous stuff, and yet we think Judas is probably not saved. I think most Christians would say Judas is not saved. Um, my mind is always open to the possibility that at the very last breath of his life, he repented and got saved, but it doesn't seem very likely. But I couldn't rule it out. I don't think the Bible explicitly says he's not saved. He's burning in hell for all of eternity. I mean, it seemed like his, his, his heart was soft before he ended. Right? He wept right? Right? Yeah. Right. Did that indicate repentance unto salvation? I don't know. Yeah. And there's talk about a pot created for destruction. There's a place where Jesus says, one of you is a devil. Um, I think I remember that. One of you is a devil. Either Jesus said that or some theologian said that about the Bible. I can't remember if it's actually in there. I'll take that as homework. I'll aspire to take it as homework. I often <laughs> say I'll take it as homework and then I often don't follow up. I confess that to you. <laughs> um, so, um, depart from me, I never knew you. So, like the uh, Yamazaki and uh, Costanza and uh, Caitlin, um, somehow their salvation wasn't in there. Their, their salvation or their thinking their salvation, their thinking their relationship with Jesus, um, it was somehow a makeover or something. It was skin deep. It wasn't in their DNA. They hadn't had the miracle happen to them, even though they were doing all this great stuff for Jesus. There are people singing so beautifully for Jesus and they're not born again. There are people making great speeches for Jesus and they're not born again. Maybe even people being used by God to affect miracles and they're not born again. If God could use a donkey and God could use a bush, maybe that's our answer. I was saying, how could they do these great things, miracles in his name, and yet he's saying, I never knew you. He's not saying you didn't do it. He's not saying it was counterfeit. He's not saying you did it in your own name. Um, maybe somehow his permissive will allowed them to do miracles in his name just as he could use a bush or a donkey to speak or something like that, and yet it didn't imply that they were saved. May we never hear, depart from me, I never knew you. Um, the, uh, some people would say, well, 
You need to believe to be saved. But James says, we won't turn there, but James says demons believe and they shudder. And his implication is strongly that uh, even though they believe, they're not saved. One could argue, yeah, but that's only demons. People, every person who believes is saved because the Bible says whosoever believes will not perish. Okay, so then that means Ku Klux Klan members, unrepentant, practicing Ku Klux Klan members that exhibit no evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit whatsoever and hang black people from trees because of the color of their skin, they're saved as long as they believe in Jesus. I don't think so. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul says, um, if you practice this, that, or the other, homosexuality, this, that, idolatry, whatever, um, you won't see the kingdom. He doesn't say anything about what you believe. He presumably could have been talking about talking to people that believe in Jesus and yet they still practice this stuff and he's saying they won't see the kingdom. So apparently, quote unquote, belief is not adequate for salvation. And I'll put belief in quotes because back to the bibliology. Right. 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 Because we can't cut out of the Bible the fact that John 3.16 says, whosoever believes will not perish. Right? That would certainly say believe. But we also know James says demons believe and they shudder. And we all, there's evidence all around us of people who believe in Jesus with their heads, but they're practicing sin unrepentantly. Also know the Bible wasn't written in English. Thank you. Right? Right? So somehow there's something about some kind of belief is not adequate that we don't fully understand. And there's something where the Bible says whosoever believes will be saved. And that's a little bit of a mystery. And the mystery could be in the area of bibliology, like our attempt at understanding the Greek is just, that's all the better it gets. It's like in English, the way we use the word love. Right. Like you can say you love your wife. Yeah. And then you can say you love a cheeseburger. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's so far away from Right, the right. It's, it's almost, uh, you know, insincere. Yeah. Irreverent to, to the words you use it that way. But I agree. That's, that's the way the language is said. I agree, I agree. I love lobster, and so I'm taking this beautiful creature and throwing it in a boiling pot to a horrible, horrible, painful death. Is that love? Is that showing that animal love of the Christian sort? I don't think so. I love it with butter and lemon, but yeah, it's not a very loving thing to do to a lobster, right? Yeah. So yeah, maybe it may be something like that with a belief. Um, and then... Uh, I'll throw these out there without turning to them. No. First, let's turn to John chapter 3. I know you've heard it a hundred times, but just hear it again in the context, trying to picture that Yamazaki, trying to picture that Costanza, trying to picture that Caitlin, trying to pass themselves off at something where they really look like it on the outside, but it didn't change their DNA. Caitlin still makes sperm, not eggs. Costanza still had the DNA of a tall man, even though he got his legs amputated. Um, John chapter 3 and verse 5. Jesus says, truly, truly. Oh, starting at, uh, sorry, starting at verse 3. John 3, 3. Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. <coughs> Excuse me. Nicodemus said to him, indicating that this is relatively mysterious. I mean, we don't know exactly what it means to be born again. Um, we know something about it, but not everything about it. And the word unless is really powerful. Right? Pretty strong word. Yes. Unless right. Like it's a right? Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. And I take some comfort from those verses um, by virtue of my limited understanding of what it means to be born again. I think Jesus is kind of indicating that it's a little bit mysterious to us, that I shouldn't feel too bad about not having a complete understanding of that. What I do have an understanding of is there was a demoniac in a graveyard, and that demoniac was so dangerous nobody could touch him. 
Um, they tried binding him with chains. They tried all kinds of stuff. He was like just scary, scary bad. I don't know if you're too young to remember probably Mike Tyson when he was in his heyday. Maybe you've seen some old tapes of him or something. Um, he was like five foot ten, and he had done a bunch of angel dust or something before becoming uh, this like the best boxer in the world with the best trainer in the world, and he had the strength of ten men. Um, he I might be exaggerating this. I might be exaggerating the story a little bit, but he was a really, really, really bad dude in the streets before he ever entered the ring, and I think he managed to pass the drug testing. Um, uh, I, I, I assume the boxing associations must have mandatory drug testing or something. So presumably he passed the drug testing, but I think there was an implication that he had some lasting effects that gave him the strength of 10 men from stuff that he did before he ever climbed in the ring. Um, and I don't know if that's an exaggeration or not. That's probably not even similar to the story that I heard. Oh, okay. What did you hear about him? I heard that he was, uh, he was a short, chubby kid that got picked on a lot. Oh, okay. He was a monster. Yeah. Oh, then, uh, well, for those watching, we'll have to check this out, and we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> we'll assign that as homework to Jerry, so, <laughs> yeah. so I don't keep saying I'll take it as homework and then not follow through. But if I don't have an answer for you next week, it's my fault, because I'm the dude holding the microphone. So <laughs> whether you come up with it or I do, um, it's still my fault. So, um, but however it worked, uh, this demoniac was like Mike Tyson. When you used to watch Mike Tyson climb into the ring and his fights were over in like 50 seconds, time and again, it was just, it was so lopsided. It was like watching an adult beat up a six-year-old child whenever you saw him get in the ring. That's what this demoniac was like. And then Jesus just like in the blink of an eye, demons be gone and the demoniac was cool. He was up, he was in his right mind, he put on clothes. That's what it's like when somebody gets born again. It's not oh, come to this club and we don't want to make you feel uncomfortable with anything. So we'll make the club look just like your favorite strip club and um, gradually we'll, we'll, we'll woo you in and you'll learn to be assimilated and with psychological and sociological tools and stuff, you'll start dressing and walking and talking just like one of us. That's no better than uh, Yamazaki and, and Costanza and, and Caitlin in terms of it's just a window dressing. It's a superficial thing. It's nice makeup. It's a, it's a makeover. It's not a DNA change. It's not a change of the nature. When someone is born again, it's so much more than just getting assimilated into a club. So I so, so appreciate if anybody's watching that is, quote, unquote, not part of the club. If anybody's watching that hasn't had the change happen that I had happen so many years ago, and you know it hasn't happened for you, and you're honest about it, and you still want to hear what I have to say for whatever reason, and you want to be here and hang out or dial in at home if any of you are watching, and you know darn well um, you're in all kinds of stuff that's totally contrary to the scriptures, and you don't feel any guilt about it, you're probably not born again. And if you're dealing honestly with that, and yet you're still interested to dial in and hear this stuff, you are our honored guest. I'm so glad you're here with us. And um, uh, if you want to be right in that day, whether the Lord is coming back this Sunday, whether there's going to be a nuclear holocaust, or what's going to happen, or if nothing happens, if you want to be right in that day, the Bible speaks of sheep and goats, that Jesus is going to take the sheep and put them on one side and take the goats and put them on the other side, wheat and tares. He's going to take the wheat and put it on one side. The tares are going to be burned up in the fire. Um, you don't want to be the goat. You don't want to be the tares. You don't want to be the thing that's going to be burning on the lake of fire for all of eternity. And yet, just your desire to not be burning on the lake of fire for all of eternity, that doesn't make you born again. We can really, really, really want to go to heaven, but if the miracle hasn't happened, and you tend to know if it hasn't happened, um, uh, it can happen for you. I, I want it to happen for you, and I would encourage you to pray that way, that the Lord would cause what happened to the demoniac, where he just changed in the blink of an eye. What happened to Paul? Saul was persecuting the church. Saul was hearing the gospel from the church, and there is no implication whatsoever in the scripture that the church was gradually wearing him down. And he was saying, you know, there's something I like about these Christians. I think I won't persecute them anymore. Instead, I think I'll go and watch the Super Bowl at their house instead of my house. <laughs> there's nothing approaching sociological or psychological wooing of Saul, assimilation of Saul. Saul was totally against the church until a blinding night knocked him off his horse and he experienced a miracle. And in the blink of an eye, he went from being Charles Manson to Mary Poppins virtually in the blink of an eye. That's what it looks like when somebody gets born again. Not 
How can we reel these people in and make the church uh, comfortable enough for them that they'll feel okay about acting like Christians? And how can we get them an accountability partner and make them do this, that, and the other so we can make sure you're still acting like a Christian, right? You better still act like a Christian. Um, Don't blow it. Don't flip somebody off on the freeway uh, because we're going to check up on you and make sure you're acting like a Christian. No, Saul didn't have any Paul. Once he became Paul, he had the miracle. He was not tempted to go back to persecuting the church. The demoniac, when he had the miracle, he wasn't tempted to go back to being a demoniac. It was so much more than just psychological or sociological programming. Sir? um, Yeah. Right. 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 Isn't that crazy? Right. I think, and this is an I think, if they were already nice, they probably would have been nice to other gods as well which is saying F you to the God of the Bible. So if they were nice to everybody in the world, probably that niceness um, probably extended to respecting and honoring demons and other gods. If they, were, if they tried to be nice to the Hindu and nice to the Buddhist and nice to the Muslim and nice to the atheist and nice to everybody, as they define niceness, as the world defines niceness, it seems probable to me that they were doing something to the God of the Bible that was not very nice. I can't imagine a person who's not a Christian saying, I want to be nice to the Muslim, so I refuse to hold hands with you as, as you pray to your God. I want to be nice to the Hindu, so I'll refuse to hold hands with you as you pray to your God. I will only pray to the God of the Bible, even though I'm not a Christian and I don't believe any of this fairy tale. I, I got to think that person is probably being so nice to everybody in the world with the best of intentions, if it's a really kind-hearted person. I've known some very kind-hearted atheists, and they don't believe any of the gods. They don't believe the God of Islam. They don't believe the God of the Bible or the Jews or the Hindus or anybody. They're very nice to everybody. But in the course of being very nice to everybody and not believing any of it, they're saying F you to God right there. But that's just a thought. I don't know. What what do you think about? Uh, I'm saying, I I was asking what the change would look So the change then would be, they would still be nice, except when it was calling upon them to commit spiritual adultery or spiritual flirtation and they would back off a little bit from some of that niceness they would show to the thousands of Hindu gods. They would back off a little bit from some of that niceness. They wouldn't sing Kumbaya, holding hands with a Muslim anymore like they might have when they were a neutral party. They would be just as nice and give the shirt off their back and be welcoming and give the guy some spinach or some hummus and some bread or whatever, you know, welcome him to their home. But there are probably compromises. The change would probably be that they would then be all about Jesus to the exclusion of other gods. Still loving the Muslim and the Hindu and all that, but doing it on terms which couldn't stumble into spiritual flirtation or adultery with gods other than Jesus. Speculating. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is the nice person who gets saved, maybe they wouldn't be as willing to compromise The nice person who doesn't know any God, um, if somebody tells him, okay, stab this baby in the head because it's the best thing for mankind, you know, in the, in the, in the, the grand scheme of things, this baby's going to be blind or dumb or deaf or mute or poor or underprivileged or something like that. So you're showing a kindness to this baby to, to put this baby out of its misery before it's born or something like that. Maybe the nice person would do that, even though it would sort of break their heart. They'd feel like that's a nice thing. And then once they became versed in the Bible and understood what murder is all about, they might refuse to do such a thing. I'm speculating. Maybe the nice person would commit uh, fornication just out of compassion. Oh, here's a lonely dude. I don't want him to feel bad. You know, <laughs> I was in the world for 30 years. There were people like that. Mercy sex, you know, we, we used a different word for it that I can't repeat here as a man of God in a chapel service. But um, probably that person who gets saved wouldn't be nice in that way. That person would be more willing to say, I'm sorry you're lonely. I ain't going to do anything about it, Uh, right? Um, I'm speculating. They might not be as nice in some situations. If it's a situation that called for them to enable somebody's sin, they might be a little bit more willing to confront sin than they were when they were nice. They might have been a little bit, uh, uh, they might have avoided confrontation when they were really nice. And now as a Christian, they would be a little bit more bold about confronting certain things, speculating, yeah. But so uh, in closing, uh, I hope none of us, I hope for none of us that believe that we're born again, 
I hope we're not fooling ourselves. I pray we're not fooling ourselves. I pray our Christianity is not like Yamazaki's Japanese-ness. I pray our Christianity is not like Costanza's shortness. I pray that our Christianity is not like Caitlin's femininity, but that our Christianity is true and real and in our very DNA from the time that the miracle happened. And for any of us for whom it hasn't happened yet, um, I pray that it would happen for them. In fact, I'm going to close this with that. Lord Jesus, please hear my prayer for any that... um, for whatever reason, are showing interest in this crazy little Wayne's World broadcast um, uh, that haven't had the miracle yet but still want to hear what we have to say. I pray that in your way and in your time, sooner rather than later, before it's too late, in your way and in your time, I pray that you would save their souls miraculously through your Holy Spirit. And I pray that if any of us are fooled, if any of us are set up to stand before you and have you say, I never knew you, please change that, no matter what the cost if I think I'm saved and I'm mistaken, if Jerry thinks he's saved and he's mistaken, if Tede thinks she's saved and she's mistaken, if any of us are mistaken, please fix that right now, no matter what the cost. I pray this in your precious and holy name, Jesus. Um, uh, we have a purple box over there for tithes and offerings if anybody wants to do that. We don't ask for donations, and it's not critical whether you give tithes or offerings to Motor Gospel Ministries, but if you name the name of Jesus as your Savior, you shouldn't rob God. You should be giving tithes and offerings somewhere. It doesn't have to be to us, but you should be somewhere. Um, the purple box is here in person, or if you're watching at home, and this is the place where you want to give your tithes and offerings, uh, go on the motorgospel.org. Uh, you'll find a chapel tab, and that has a PayPal link on it for your tithes and offerings. We love you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. God bless you. Stop broadcast.